What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day Podcast. We've got a lot to discuss, but the primary topic is going to be the Packers wide receiver position, or more specifically, what Green Bay should do at that position now that Devontae Adams is with the Las Vegas Raiders, playing with his good friend Derek Carr, and leaving Aaron Rodgers and the Packers really with a major void at the wide receiver position. Now let's rewind about a week ago when we were all expecting that Devontae Adams was going to be a member of the Green Bay Packers and sort of think back to, yes, not only Aaron Rodgers maybe over-targeting, probably not maybe, just over-targeting Devontae Adams in the, the playoff game against the San Francisco 49ers, but let's also review the fact that we were sort of all talking about and openly discussing the fact that Green Bay needed to figure out a way to probably add another weapon across from Devontae Adams. Because if you go back and watch the 49ers game and other games throughout the season, it was very clear that in key situations, teams were keen on Devontae, taking him away and making other receivers beat them. And either they weren't able to, or Rodgers wasn't looking their way. And they're just wasn't a great balance and somebody to sort of take some of that pressure off of Devante or more importantly, roll some of that coverage off Devante so Devante could be utilized in some of those key situations. Put that juxtaposed to the Rams and having Cooper Cup and Odell Beckham against that same 49ers defense, and you can very clearly tell there was a major difference. So even a week ago, We're openly discussing the fact that Green Bay probably needs to figure out what to do at wide receiver to sort of make it, again, a little bit less burdensome for Devontae Adams in those situations. I think we were also expecting that Marquez Valdez-Scantling was probably going to be gone at that point. Again, Devontae would be back, probably Randall Cobb back. But now you have this major paradigm shift at the wide receiver position with Devontae Adams heading to Las Vegas. We've already discussed whether that's good, bad, ugly, etc., But what does it mean now going forward for the Packers at that key position? Because while I think it's fair to believe that Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur have the ability to do some of the heavy lifting and figure out ways to get receivers open or throw receivers open, you still in clutch situations need receivers to be able to get open, gain separation, and do some of that hard work themselves. Or even more importantly, even when... Rodgers is able to throw them open or LaFleur is able to scheme them open, do something after the catch, which that playmaking element with an Alan Lazard, Randall Cobb at this point in his career, Amari Rodgers at this point still being very young and not showing a ton of season to go, they don't have those playmaking options. So the wide receiver position, even just weapons on offense, really outside of Aaron Jones, are lacking in that dynamic playmaking ability, and they don't have a ton of guys who can gain separation. More on that in just a moment. But before we start looking at what Green Bay needs and what players could potentially fill some of those voids, I think it's really important to sort of discuss the current state of the Packers wide receivers. What do we know sort of for sure at this point? So let's talk about the three receivers who, in my opinion, are very good locks to make the roster this season. And I think it's worth noting here that it's likely that Green Bay keeps six receivers. Now, they have kept seven wide receivers at times, so they could go in that direction again. Now, if they're going to keep seven, I think it's safe to assume that that seventh wide receiver is probably focused on special teams, somebody like a Malik Taylor, someone like that who can be a gunner and, and handle some maybe some different kick return duties, etc. But I think it's probably a little bit more special teams focused. So if we're looking at this purely from a skill position, wide receiver position standpoint, probably keeping six. And in my opinion, three of those spots are already taken. And that's Randall Cobb, Alan Lazard, and Amari Rogers. Now say what you will about Amari Rogers. It would be pretty shocking if they moved up to get him in the third round a season ago and then just moved on from him. I still think there's way too much untapped potential for Green Bay to do something like that. Now, of course, injuries and other things could flex this in a variety of different directions. But as we sit here today, Randall Cobb, Amari Rogers, and Alan Lazard would be the three that you were sort of expecting on the roster which means that there's likely three spots for actual wide receivers. Again, you do have a Malik Taylor, a Juwan Winfrey, who could be potential options there, but you're probably looking for something a little bit more of a sure bet. Probably Malik Taylor, again, maybe he could make it as a special teams guy. Maybe Juwan Winfrey could take a major step, but you'd still probably be looking at 
or hoping for wide receivers who could maybe elevate that position to a different level than what a Malik Taylor or a Jawan Winfrey are probably going to be able to do at any point this upcoming season. So that brings me back to the point where you have three wide receiver spots open. And I think it would be fairly shocking if, if, if Green Bay didn't draft a wide receiver in some capacity, right? Probably early, maybe very early, but Gre- Green Bay is going to add a wide receiver in this draft that they're going to roster at, at some point, right? So you can almost argue now you've got four of your main spots covered, at least one draft pick that's going to be drafted early, Randall Cobb, Amari Rogers, and Alan Lazard. I think those things are safe to say. So you probably have two other positions open that not even including the draft are going to come open. And we'll discuss the draft here in a little bit of detail as well. But before we get to some players who could be options for those remaining arguably two spots, arguably at the top of your receiver roster, let's go through what Green Bay needs and what they want at this wide receiver position. I think the first thing that's really worth pointing out here is that Green Bay doesn't really need a slot wide receiver, or at least a wide receiver who's primarily going to win in the slot. I know a lot of people were talking about Juju Smith-Schuster, and to be fair, he got a very likable contract that I think Green Bay still should have been in the conversation for, but they don't really need a slot receiver, which is primarily where Juju plays. You look at the wide receiver snaps in the slot, and you would expect that Randall Cobb is going to get a huge chunk of those. Amari Rogers is another player who, if he does get snaps, those snaps will come from the slot. And Alan Lazard actually plays a decent amount of his snaps in the slot as well as sort of that bigger, more physical uh, slot type receiver. So they actually have probably enough receivers already that that slot position is covered. And again, I don't think any of those are specifically, like if they fell in love with a receiver that was a primary slot guy, I don't think that those players would necessarily justify like being able to ignore that player entirely. But it, it's more important to point out here, Cobb's just playing in the slot. Amari's just playing in the slot. Again, Lazard, probably 50% of his snaps, maybe about 40% of his snaps are going to come from the slot. The only receiver that you really have that can play on the outside right now is Alan Lazard. So if you bring in somebody who is specifically a slot receiver, you still have at least one major question mark as an outside receiver. And that's assuming that Alan Lazard's going to be that other guy, which again, I think you're still probably hoping that Lazard can maybe be a little bit more movable and maybe not be somebody who's playing 800, 900, 1,000 snaps a season as a primary outside wide receiver. So just getting a pure slot guy doesn't necessarily fix the problems that you have. I think you're hoping that maybe that position can mostly be covered with a Lazard and Amari Rogers and a Randall Cobb. And then also, no matter who you get, right? Like if you're getting a really good wide receiver at any point, whether it be draft, free agency, trade, they're likely able to play some in the slot as well. So that position pri- you know, becomes covered by picking up a outside wide receiver. If you pick up a guy that's just a slot guy, you don't really answer any of the questions that you already have. So you probably want to avoid a primary slot receiver. Next up, I think really the biggest thing here is separation. If you look at the state of the current wide receivers, again, that Green Bay has on the roster, Randall Cobb is no longer this massive separation artist. Yes, he can get, he has some nuance in the slot. Yes, he can uncover versus zone, but it's not like he's going to match up with a shifty corner and just beat him with speed or physical ability. It's not Randall Cobb anymore. Mari Rogers isn't nuanced enough yet and frankly isn't speedy enough either to be that type of guy. And Alan Lazard is not a separator. At some point, you need wide receivers who can just gain separation at the point of attack and get open, whether that's via route running or just pure athleticism. You need somebody who can gain separation on those key downs and that Rodgers can trust and look to in those those situations. As I mentioned, playmaking is also a major issue here. Now, if you get an MVS back, something like that, maybe you have that deep threat, but you're looking for ideally somebody who can get the ball in their hands and just become a playmaker. The threat of, you know, Tyree Kill is obviously the extreme example here, right? But the fact that you can just get the ball to Tyree Kill at any point and he's just a threat to take off and score a touchdown from anywhere on the field. Debo Samuel in a different way, AJ Brown in a different way, right? That physical run after the catch, you know, ability to break tackles, etc. Those things are what Green Bay needs. They need somebody who can break tackles or just win with speed and be a threat to take it down the field and get run after the catch. Like they don't have that playmaking ability right now. 
blocking is another huge thing. We know how much Matt LaFleur values blocking in this offense. You simply cannot go out there and just not block. Like you have to be at least a decent blocker. Now, they had some accident forgiveness in that capacity for Devontae Adams. Devontae was never a great blocker, but that almost put more of a priority on everyone else in the field, like an Alan Lazard and Equinemius St. Brown and MVS. Like those guys had to be good blockers because frankly, Devontae wasn't that good at it. Although he was better this past season than he had been in 2020 and 2019, he did take a step in the right direction. But this is an offense that is predicated on everyone blocking. Think of all those quick wide receiver screens to the outside. Think of how they like to use their running backs, whether again, it be on screens, whether it be on, um, you know, again, quick plays to the outside or just through the running game. They are really focusing on their receivers and tight ends being blockers down the field to spring some of those big runs. It is a major priority and emphasis for Matt LaFleur in this offense. Next up is attention to detail. This is an offense that, again, the illusion of complexity, right? There's a lot that goes into that. I go back to this quite often, but when I interviewed Taylor Merritt's former Wisconsin Badger offensive lineman uh, who played under Matt LaFleur for the Tennessee Titans when he was their offensive coordinator, I point blank asked him, what's the hardest position in Matt LaFleur's offense to learn? And without hesitation, he said wide receiver. You have to have a great attention to detail. And that's just from a Matt LaFleur standpoint. You know who needs the most attention to detail in the world at wide receiver? Aaron Rodgers. You need to have pinpoint accuracy for how you're running your routes and for where you're going to be on the field. Like If he doesn't trust you to have that attention to detail and be a nuanced route runner, he's not going to look your way and he's certainly not going to throw you the ball. So that is something that is also massively important here. I think if you're ideally looking at it, if you're going to add two wide receivers, you know, at the top of your roster, you would ideally like some sort of deep threat that can open up everything else underneath. And then you would likely want your possession receiver, your consistent target, maybe a little bit more of a playmaker, right? I think if you could balance those two things out a little bit, I think that would give you a more balanced offense. You've got kind of your possession receiver in Alan Lazard. You've got your slot guy in Randall Cobb. You get your speed guy on the outside, and then you've got more your consistent do everything playmaking wide receiver. That's the ideal scenario, but they have a lot to add to get to that point. And that's why we're going to go through some of Green Bay's options today. So of course, Green Bay has a variety of different options. They can go the trade route, they could re-sign MVS. They could sign a player in free agency. They could draft players. There's a variety of things that they can do. So let's go one by one at these different options and see what could make some sense. So I know already, myself included, everyone's throwing around some potential trade options for Green Bay, some targets that Green Bay could at least make phone calls about to check on availability to see what pricing would be. Some names that I consistently hear or I think could make some sense, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Corey Davis, Brandon Cooks, Deontay Johnson, or Chase Claypool. DJ Moore was a name I had on that list. The Panthers just extended him to a big contract. He's no longer going anywhere, probably wasn't going anywhere anyway, but you can take that name certainly off the list now. So again, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, Corey Davis, Brandon Cooks, Deontay Johnson, and Chase Claypool. Let's start with, let's just kind of go one through one, one by one through these for a second. DK Metcalf is the dream scenario here, right? And I know people are like, well, he's not the most nuanced route runner. Shut up. Like the guy is so physically gifted as a pure physical wide receiver and what he can bring down the field that teams have to play off from him, which sets up some of the quick passing game. Like Green Bay and Matt LaFleur would be able to do so much with DK Metcalf. Now he's not a great blocker yet, but he has the physicality and the size and the strength to be able to do that. It would be something that he would have to pick up in this offense, but that is clearly a dream scenario. Now, the issue with DK Metcalf, A, we don't know if he's available, although it has seemed like there maybe has been some falling out between Seattle and Metcalf at times. B, how much is Seattle willing to trade Metcalf in the conference? Now, they're not ready to compete right now. So, you know, trading them in conference maybe isn't the biggest deal. They probably just want the best offer, but they could make an argument that maybe it's not the best idea to trade DK to the Green Bay Packers. That would certainly be understandable. Maybe they would ship him to the AFC. We know the AFC West is trying to add any player they can, could probably get a lot from some AFC West team, but that's another issue. And then maybe the bigger issue, right, is if DK Metcalf gets traded, he has a ton of leverage in contract negotiations. You're probably giving up over a first round pick. I think like a first and a fourth, fourth, you know, first and a fifth. 
You're giving up a ton of compensation for DK Metcalf. Now he's going to become a free agent and he's going to say, I, you know, I want to be the top wide receiver in football, especially if he has a big year under Aaron Rodgers. And now you put yourself in a position where you're giving another huge contract, oh, probably around 25 to 26 million per season. Again, if Christian Kirk's getting paid massive amounts of money, if Mike Williams is getting 20 million per year, you can bet DK Metcalf's asking for at least 25 a season from now. So that becomes a major issue where, again, Green Bay is going to be strapped for cash in the coming seasons. So do you really want to trade first round picks plus, plus give out a massive contract and give all the leverage to DK Metcalf and his agent? Probably not. And again, Seattle may not want to trade him to begin with anyway. Tyler Lockett, similarly, you know, Seattle may not look to trade him. Even if he is, he's played a lot in the slot as well not the biggest blocking wide receiver, so may not be the perfect fit in those scenarios or situations either. Brandon Cooks, same thing with the Texans, right? You know, getting up there in age a little bit, but a little bit of an undersized receiver, certainly could be a deep threat, you know, has the ability to run all those receiver screens, gets the playmaking ability, but the blocking, blocking is a major issue for Brandon Cooks, does not fit their mold at wide receiver. I do not think he would necessarily be in play. Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool in Pittsburgh, like I've mentioned before, maybe there's some scenario where you can tr- you know, ship Jordan Love plus some draft capital for a wide receiver. We know that the Steelers are probably confident that they can draft more receivers and have success because they basically draft one every year that ends up being really good. So maybe they're like, yeah, we can trade Chase Claypool or Deontay Johnson, still have the other one and you know, find two more receivers in the draft that'll help us, especially by the time they're ready to compete again. So that could be an option. Uh, Again, especially if maybe you're throwing Jordan Love in a deal or something like that where they need a young quarterback to develop. Chase Claypool makes a lot of sense. He has the physicality. He can be a big blocker. He can play on the outside. So there's a lot to like about that. I'm less confident that the Steelers would be willing to trade Deontay Johnson. He also has some issues with drops, but you talk about separation. Deontay Johnson's one of the best in the business at gaining separation and would work fantastic in this offense. He's a decent blocker. Like he probably fits better than almost anyone, but again, not sure Pittsburgh would be too keen on parting with him either. The player here from a trade standpoint that I think makes the most sense is actually Corey Davis. Now there's some pluses and some minuses here. The pluses are clearly, he has played with Matt LaFleur in Matt LaFleur's system. They were together in Tennessee when Matt LaFleur was there as offensive coordinator. He'd be able to pick up on the offense very well. He's a nuanced route runner. He's not the most dynamic playmaker, but he would give you a a true option, especially playing with somebody like Aaron Rodgers, who could be your sort of every down, trustable guy, possession wide receiver, do a little bit after the catch. I think there's a lot of things that make sense there, again, especially knowing that he has familiarity with this offense. I also think that the Jets aren't really in a situation where they're exactly competing right now anyway. So moving on from you know Davis after he didn't do a ton last year, I think could make some sense from their standpoint as well. There's some downsides though. One, the Jets don't really have that outside wide receiver either. And if you're moving forward with Zach Wilson as your quarterback, you want to give him options. Yes, they have Braxton Berrios who they just brought back and you know they spent a second round uh, you know pick on a wide receiver a season ago and they've got Denzel Mims and like there's some things that they can do, but they don't really have anyone like a Corey Davis. And you would think that they're going to want to give Zach Wilson targets to see what he's capable of. So they may not be too keen on trading him either. The other issue is he'd have a $13 million, almost all guaranteed contract this season. Next year would be similar, but almost none, you know, none guaranteed, I should say. So Green Bay would have him for this season. You know, Next year, they could move on if they wanted. And he would also be a big candidate to add void years to the contract and some things like that to renegotiate that and potentially get his cap number down significantly this season. So it's nowhere near the 13 mil and actual value. So There'd be some things you'd have to work out. Trade compensation would be another interesting topic here. But to me, if you're looking at a trade candidate that makes it like you're probably not going to have to give a top tier pick for Corey Davis. Like if again, if if Amari Cooper's going for a fifth, Davis makes a little bit less, but I still think you're probably in that fourth or fifth round pick. You get to keep all of your top picks, bring in a guy that knows Matt LaFleur's offense. Again, not the most dynamic playmaker, but somebody that would give you a true potential number one wide receiver, especially playing with Aaron Rodgers. I could see that making a lot of sense for Green Bay and maybe a more realistic trade option than a DK Metcalf, a Deontay Johnson, et cetera. All right. So uh, Elijah Moore is the second round pick. I was trying to figure out for the Jets, by the way. Uh, Let's go the re-sign route. 
All right, MVS still out there. This is clearly a direction that Green Bay could go. Now I'm torn here. I like the idea of getting MVS back. I think they clearly need a deep threat to open things up. And I do think that he has made strides as a as a blocker. I do think that there is still upside for MVS to be a true breakout candidate. I think if he all of a sudden becomes your pseudo number one, while that is not ideal in any way, shape, or form, I do think that he has the ability to put up maybe a 70 catch, you know, 16, 1700 yard season, whatever. Like, I think that possibility is there. Now, my bigger issue is I do think based on the current wide receiver market that you're probably overpaying for MVS. And maybe my biggest issue yet is just Rodgers and MVS have never been on the same page. And MVS has had a lot of opportunities under both Matt LaFleur and Mike McCarthy to make an impact, to be a starter, to keep a consistent role within the offense. And whether it be via injury, whether it be via inconsistency, whether it be in a variety of things, by the end of the year, it always seems like he's out of the rotation or just not putting up big numbers. And that's basically happened for four straight seasons. The lack of consistency has been a major issue. And the fact that MVS and Rodgers have just never really been on the same page gives me a lot of hesitancy here. Now he knows the offense, good blocker, deep threat. There are a lot of things to like. And if tomorrow the announcement comes that MVS is back with Green Bay, based on the contract, I still think that that could make a lot of sense. So we'll see what happens there. But I do still think that MVS should clearly be in play, but the contract would be very interesting. And if you all of a sudden have to overpay because other teams are bidding major money, I think you have to potentially look at saying, hey, maybe it's time to go in another direction, which if you're going in those directions, let's take a look at what free free agent options are available there. Some names that I know people will throw out there, um, Jarvis Landry, Julio Jones, Odell Beckham, Will Fuller, and I'm going to add one more in there, and that's Sammy Watkins. So I want to go through these really quick. Let's start with Jarvis Landry. Now, Jarvis can play outside and inside, but his most effective position is still in the slot. Using him on the outside can work, and I do think he can have success there, especially with Aaron Rodgers. And I do think this remains an option, but his, his best way to be a playmaker is still probably in the slot. And as I mentioned before, that's probably the last thing you want. And now maybe if you bring back Lazard, you know, obviously Lazard, but an MVS alongside of Landry, okay, you've got MVS and Lazard who can play on the outside with Landry in the slot. You can mix in some Landry on the outside with MVS and put Randall Cobb in the slot. Like, it's not so bad. Like you could certainly make that work, but I'm just not sure based off of where Landry's at and his best ability to win being in the slot, if that's ultimately the best option. I really like Jarvis Landry. He's probably my favorite receiver that's on the market. So if, if, again, Green Bay decides to bring him in, I would certainly understand it. But you could also look at where they're at right now and what they need and say that Jarvis Landry doesn't fit that the best overall. You're going to make that argument for a lot of wide receivers, however, because nobody's this perfect fit or we would be clearly talking about them. Julio Jones, I talked a bit about yesterday on the video as well. But I do think Julio can make some sense. I do think there is the propensity for a player like Julio Jones, who has been one of the best wide receivers at football in his prime, to get a chance to play with Aaron Rodgers and say, all right, if that guy's doing it at almost age 40, like I can go out and have a successful season and still play a really amazing brand of football at my age and go out and work really hard, come in the best shape of his life and go out and have an amazing season. And the upside of a Julio Jones is higher than pretty much any other receiver that you could bring in at this point. But the fact that his body's breaking down, he's had so many injuries, like there's a lot of risk there. Now, the risk reward is maybe the most interesting with Julio because again, the risk is that he misses a ton of games. The reward is that if he looks anything like, not even like A-level Julio Jones, right? But if he's like B, B plus level Julio Jones with Aaron Rodgers, like look the heck out. Like that's incredibly dangerous. Plus he's worked with the Falcons, which is that, you know, he's worked in the Kyle Shanahan offense. Like it's not going to take him long to understand everything. You know, Rogers would love playing with him. He's an outside wide receiver. He has playmaking potential, even when he, you know, even with some of the injury issues, like he's been good when he's been healthy. Like there's still a lot to like about Julio Jones, but a lot of risk there as well. And again, contract is going to be huge. And also, Like, yes, it sounds great that, hey, maybe this guy's going to come in and really be motivated to play with Aaron Rodgers and have a chance at a Super Bowl. Jimmy Graham had that, and there was no difference, right? In fact, he was worse with Green Bay than he was with Chicago playing with Justin Fields. Like, there's no guarantee that he's going to come in and give it, you know, his everything you think it is, like Julius Peppers did. And, And 
the, one of the reasons I think Julio is a real option here is because legitimately, like like Green Bay is like these players. Like part of it, most of it was Ted Thompson, right? But like Jimmy Graham, I don't know what Charles Woodson, like these Julius Peppers, like these rare athletes, these rare players, even after their prime a little bit, Woodson obviously a little bit different there, but like Green Bay hasn't hesitated to add those sort of players uh, to their roster. I think Julio could be in play, but again, there's a lot of risk there. Sammy Watkins is to me like your fallback option here. But what I will say is again, Green Bay has a type, a bigger, more physical wide receiver. He's a solid uh, run blocker, not the playmaker, right? But he still has some deep speed. I think he could work better in this Green Bay style of offense. And what you're looking for is is basically Green Bay doing the same thing that they did with Devondre Campbell, right? Look at the guy that has the size, the speed, the athleticism, but just hasn't found the right home. And you can make actually a strong argument that the, the offenses that he's played with, Kansas City and Baltimore and you know Buffalo, that those offenses have not been this Matt LaFleur, Kyle Shanahan offense. Maybe like Devondre Campbell getting in the right spot with the right athleticism unlocks that talent. He was a top pick for a reason back in the day. And if Green Bay can unlock that and he can become a star with Aaron Rodgers at a cheap price, maybe that could happen. And again, Green Bay has a type. Sammy Watkins' physical profile fits that type. Just hasn't been that good, even with Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson at quarterback. So the odds that he comes in and just tears it up in Green Bay are slim. But I would have said, and I did say the same thing about Devondre Campbell coming to Green Bay, watch the tape in Arizona and Atlanta and tell me he's going to be good. You couldn't. He was phenomenal. So sometimes you just get the right fit, the right player and the right fit and it takes off. That's what you'd be hoping with for Sammy Watkins. Odell Beckham, I don't think makes a ton of sense. And the reason I say that is Green Bay has enough guys coming off of ACLs. David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins, Robert Tunyon, Kylan Hill. Like at some point, you just need guys that are healthy and ready to play this season. Like you already are in a really tight salary cap situation. You have three guys that are going to start on the injured list already. That means you're already at a 56-man roster to start the season. And there will be more, but Kylan Hill, Robert Tunyon, Elton Jenkins are starting the season on you know probably the pup list. Those guys count towards your salary cap and you need to still fill a 53-man roster and a practice squad. Like how many guys are you gonna carry that aren't ready till November, December? You just have to be really careful with how many guys you're doing that with. And I just don't think Beckham makes sense because of that and in that scenario. Another guy is Will Fuller. And I got to say, the more I looked at Will Fuller, the more he intrigued me. You go back to his last seasons in Houston, he was playing really good football. Green Bay was interested in him at the trade deadline, but just couldn't come to compensation agreement with the Texans. He ultimately goes to Miami and then everything falls apart. So, you know, after the trade deadline, of course, he gets suspended and uh, due to performance enhancing drugs. So that's a major issue. He gets suspended for the remainder of the season in the first game of last year. And then he plays in two games, breaks his thumb, and is out the remainder of the year. I think he had like four catches or two or four catches, something like that, for the Dolphins last year before injuring his thumb and being out. So in the last season and a half, he's done nothing. He's been suspended or hurt. Now, the good news is that he hasn't doesn't have a ton of wear and tear on his body, right? Like this is a player who theoretically should be in great shape should be able to take the top off of a defense, has the ability to be a playmaker, and could fill that role on the outside if you can't bring an MVS back of, of deep threat to open things underneath for everyone else. And probably a little bit more of a consistent player than what MVS is. But again, just had a year and a half off due to suspensions and injuries. So you have to wonder like, all right, which Will Fuller are you getting? And if, you, if he has another performance enhancing drug issue, then you're gonna lose him for the season. So there's some risk there as well. And again, that's why you go back to the fact that there's it's really difficult to find these perfect options. And that brings you to the draft, right? And I'm not going to go draft pick by draft pick. I'm going to go into, soon I'm going to go into much more detail with these wide receivers and how they could fit in Green Bay and do specific episodes on a lot of these guys. But you probably know the names by now. Chris Olave, Jamison Williams, Jahan Dotson, Traylon Burks, Garrett Wilson, Drake London, George Pickens, etc. Like there's a lot of wide receivers out, out there. Some are really good options. Again, we could talk about Jamison Williams and the ACL. Like there's just how many guys you're going to take with ACLs into the season or that aren't going to be able to play till October, November, December. I think Green Bay has to be cognizant of that. But there's a lot of receivers out, out there that could fit Green Bay and could help them fill in this gap. And it, like I said, 
I would be very shocked with their first four picks if they don't take a wide receiver in the first four rounds. However, that's not necessarily the be all end all. So let's take a look at the last three drafts, right? There's basically been about 11 guys that have been ready to play in the last three drafts. So 34 guys total taken in the first two rounds of the last three drafts, 34. About 11 of them were able to come in right away and play at a pretty high level. Jamar Chase last year was insane. Jalen Waddell for the Dolphins. Devontae Smith played very well for the Eagles as a rookie. CeeDee Lamb for the Cowboys. Justin Jefferson for the Vikings, of course. Chase Claypool for the Steelers. T. Higgins for the Bengals. I would also argue like Jerry Judy was probably there if he had a better quarterback, just didn't have the quarterbacking, but I would make an argument that Jerry Judy was there as well. Debo Samuel for the 49ers, AJ Brown for the Titans, and DK Metcalf for the Seahawks. I would argue those 11 guys out of the 34 were ready to jump in and play from day one and be really good wide receivers. So you basically have a one in three chance of ending up with one of those guys, at least over the last three seasons. There's been a lot of guys that haven't been ready to play right away. Kadarius Toney, Rashad Bateman, Elijah Moore, Rondale Moore, Dwayne Eskridge, Tutu Atwell, Terrace Marshall. Again, some of these guys were good, right? But not like playing at a high level right away. Henry Ruggs, Jalen Rager, Brandon Ayuk, Michael Pittman towards the end of his rookie year was getting there, LaVisca Chenault, KJ Hamler, Van Jefferson, Denzel Mims, Hollywood Brown-ish, Nikhil Harry, McCole Hardman, JJ Ortega-Whiteside, Andy Isabella, Deontay Johnson, again, towards the end of his rookie year, more in year two, he was getting there, Um, you know, and then Jalen Hurd just never got off the ground, but like there's been a lot of misses within those first two rounds as well. So again, basically you'd have like a one in three chance, but Jamar Chase, Jalen Waddell, Devontae Smith, uh, CeeDee Lamb, and Jerry Judy, five of those 11 were all taken before pick 20. Again, Green Bay's at pick 22 with that Raiders pick. So five of the 11, not even available to be selected when you get into the 20s. So again, just note that there's only six guys in the last three drafts that have been drafted, picked 22 or later, that have made a pretty major impact in their first seasons. So it's great. And again, I think Green Bay will draft someone, but the results of that haven't always been amazing. And again, those six players that have been taken 22 or later and had an immediate impact, Justin Jefferson, Chase Claypool, T. Higgins, Debo Samuel, A.J. Brown, and D.K. Metcalf. All right. So we've got re-sign option, sign option, trade option, draft options. So I think what you now have to sort of ask is, all right, A, what other options are out there? Maybe you could sign a tight end, right? All right, what else is out there at tight end? You're not going Jimmy Graham again. Like Eric Ebron's out there. That doesn't move the needle. Jared Cook is out there. I don't see that happening again. Neither of them are good blockers. They don't fit well within this offense or this scheme. So I don't see that happening. So that sort of rules that out. They could draft tight ends as well. That's an option, but rookie tight ends rarely are ready to come in and compete at a high level right away, especially as receiving tight ends. So how, how much value do you want to put into these playmakers? And ultimately, what would I do? The first thing I'm doing is I'm legitimately calling the Seahawks and saying, all right, where where are we at at your wide receivers? You know, Specifically DK Metcalf. I think if you can add him, he cha- completely changes the dynamic of your offense has the ability to be a playmaker, deep threat. He hustles, he plays hard. Like I could see him fitting in. Is the attention to detail, the route running, some of those things perfect? No, but I think Aaron Rodgers getting to throw to DK is probably you know, a consolation for maybe not having some of those key attributes. Again, he's not a great run blocker, but you would also hope that that's something that he could develop based on his size and physicality. And again, what, what we have to ask is, is how much resources do you wanna put into this position? If you go out and you you know sign one of these guys, let's say it's a Jarvis Landry or a Julio Jones and bring back an MVS and draft a guy in the first round, you're putting a ton of resources into that position. And what sort of ROI are you going to get? Are you even going to be as good as what you had with Devontae Adams and MVS and Lazard and Cobb a season ago? The answer might be no. So you, know, you very well could look at, is there better ways to sort of spend the capital? Do you want to just try to go out and make your defense much better? Do you want to make your offense, try to make your offensive line as great as it could possibly be? Maybe bring in a tackle to compete with Yash Nyman at right tackle. And then maybe, you know, again, when Elton comes back, put him at guard, John Runyon Jr., Josh Myers. All of a sudden you've got Bakhtiari and a really good tackle on the outside. 
with Jenkins and Runyon at guard, Myers at center, like you're looking really good. Do you want to go in that direction? I think there's a fair argument to be made of like maybe putting all these this you know money and resources into wide receiver isn't the best use and maybe go out and find good players that you can find at other positions and spend that money and let again you know Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers do some of the heavy lifting at quarterback and offensive coordinator basically head coach slash coordinator of of drawing up an offense that's going to work for these wide receivers and it's not super far-fetched to say that that's worked in a lot of different scenarios with Aaron Rodgers you know spreading the ball around and not focusing and targeting on one player but again, come playoff time, you could run into issues there. So what am I doing? I'm still putting I'm putting resources into the position. I'm going to really look at Corey Davis, Julio Jones, maybe a Sammy Watkins as one guy uh, as my sort of overall wide receiver. I'm going to bring in either an MVS or a Will Fuller as my deep threat. Lazard's back, Cobb is back, Amari Rodgers is back. And then I'm still probably spending a first or second rounder on the position to round things out. I think if you get more of a possession overall wide receiver in Julio Jones, Sammy Watkins, or Corey Davis, I think that gives you one good option with either MVS or Fuller as a speed option on the other side. Maybe it could be interesting if you brought in MVS and Fuller. I don't love it, but not opposed to that. You could maybe go in that direction. But I think one speed guy, one more possession guy could be the answer to your problems. With my first rounder, I'm going to look for a playmaker. You've got Cobb, you've got Lazard, you've got Amari. I feel like that really rounds out a really solid wide receiver position with Tunyon coming back at tight end. Mercedes Lewis is my blocker. Two good running backs. Hopefully Bakhtiari, Jenkins, Myers, John Runyon Jr. I don't know, maybe a Royce Newman, whomever eventually. Like, I feel like you have a really well-rounded offense in that regard that can still put up some points, especially if this defense continue, you know, can continue to grow with where they're at right now. And last, what I'll say here is I do think that Green Bay can overall be better on offense, even if they don't have better wide receivers. I think their offensive line can be way better than it was a season ago, which can open up a more explosive and dynamic running game, which opens up more play action and bootleg, which teams just weren't buying a season ago. And I think Rodgers spreading the ball around more can make things more complicated for defenses. I think they can be more balanced. I think Robert Tunyon coming back could be very beneficial. I think Josiah DeGuaro could take a step. I think we could see, again, a more balanced version of this offense. But make no mistake about it, there are that they need to take steps at wide receiver. And whether they go via draft, whether they go via free agency, bringing back an MVS, trading for a receiver... All of those options are out there, but they're going to have to figure out what works best for them and how they can make this the most dynamic offense possible as they go all in for these last two years under Aaron Rodgers. That is going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. I always appreciate it. We'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.